Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome back to another episode of uh, our Beating Hearts webinar. And today I have with me my cardiologist colleague, uh, whom I've not met for a long time because of this um, COVID pandemic. So we can't meet. And the last time we met was maybe three, four years ago in Osaka. Yeah. Hi, Raj. How are you? I'm good. How are you? It's so good to see you. Yes, and thank you so much for, um, you know, giving no. us the honor of hearing you give us this talk, which yeah. we have not covered actually uh, in our webinar. So without further ado, uh, please go ahead and tell us more. Oh, right. Uh, thank you very much, Betty. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be invited, actually. Uh, I've always been a big fan of yours and, and uh, you know, there's a lot of teaching up to do. Uh, so uh, today I, I'm going to talk to you about, uh, you know, acute coronary syndrome. It's, it's the number one killer, uh, the big problem. It's the reason, you know, you go to see God most of the time. Uh, so, um, you know, but my focus, um, I, I mean, before I started, you know, I actually asked Betty, what are the type of people that I'll be talking to? And she told me mainly it'll be junior doctors and medical students. So I've tailored these presentations, uh, tailored this presentation to your needs. So without much delay, I'm uh, Dharmaraj Kartikesan. You can call me Raj. I'm an interventional cardiologist from Hospital Sultana Bahia, Alosta. And uh, my first slide itself is uh, not moving. Okay, so my first slide itself, yeah, I'm going to talk to you about this National Cardiovascular Database on Acute Coronary Syndrome. This registry was done in 2014, 2015. It's, it's an old one. This is the one I got my hands on. And uh, it tells you that the mean age of acute coronary syndrome is moving to a, it's, it's becoming younger and younger. So our mean age in Malaysia is 58.6. Uh, whereas in Thailand is 63.5. And in Singapore, they are much older at 68.3 to 69.2. And if you look closely, there's an increase in the 40 to 50 age group, uh, for 40 to 50 years age group. So this is an alarming uh, thing, and we believe it is all related to unhealthy lifestyle. So the lecture outline is mainly going to focus on typical and atypical ACS presentation. So just before I start, I would like to request for those who are watching, you know, if you are not speaking to turn off, uh, to put on your mute button, because we can hear echoes when I'm speaking if there are too many uh, speakers on. So, um, so first, I'm going to talk to you about the typical and atypical ACS presentations. And then I'm going to show you very interesting ECGs of ST elevation MI. I'm going to focus more on ST elevation MI and because that's the one you're going to meet and that's the, and that's the one you're going to see often. And when you're going to get, you're going to have, a, uh, when you start working, this is the one you're not sure. Are you dealing with an MI? Are you not dealing with an MI? Rest assured, um, once you're done with this presentation, I think things will be much, much clearer. So let's get on to it. So what's a typical presentation of ACS? Usually it will come with substernal chest pain. It occurs in exertion and relieves by rest. It's relieved by rest. So if you have all these three, it is most likely you're having acute coronary syndrome. You will have referred pain to your arm, to your jaw, neck, back, even sometimes to your abdomen if you have an inferior MI. Uh, and sometimes pain also radiates to the shoulder, Nausea and vomiting is common, D difficulty in breathing, diaphoresis, profuse sweating, lightheadedness. And in young patients, you always got to think of, very young patients, you have to think of this acute coronary vasospasm, especially if they have transient ST elevation, which resolves on its own. But even then, you can only confirm this with a coronary assessment. And you should also take a very careful drug history because drug abuse with cocaine or methamphetamine these can also cause uh, coronary spasms and give you uh, ECG changes of ST elevation or non STEMI or unstable in China. So, the physical exam examination is relatively normal in most of them. You may have a new onset MR if you have an acute papillary muscle rupture, and these patients will be very ill. Uh, sometimes they can be hyper, most if they are hypotensive, this uh, offers a graver prognosis lung crepitation, third heart sound, raised JVP. These are things that you learn in medical school. If these things are there, sometimes it indicates a much graver prognosis. If you have a chest wall tenderness, it reduces the likelihood of acute coronary syndrome. Now, if you ask a patient very specifically where, I'll give you a clue. If you're going to ask a patient history about uh, acute coronary syndrome, 
if they can, if you tell them, can you point to a place in your chest where the pain is? If they can point to a specific area and say the pain is there, it's very unlikely to be acute coronary syndrome. Because acute coronary syndrome, they will put a fist and say that it's this entire area that is painful. It won't be a single point. So this is a very important clue. So then you have to remember about this atypical presentation of acute coronary syndrome. Uh, this is something that you have to be very careful and you have to know because these are the patients that are often missed. And they come with gastrointestinal or respiratory symptoms, but not really with chest pain. And you should always be mindful of angina equivalence. If they say that there is a pain in the jaw or shoulder pain, if they have multiple risk factors for ischemic heart disease, make sure you do an ECG for them. And in the absence of chest pain, the most significant factor predicting lower use of thrombolysis. So if you don't have chest pain, people do not do an ECG and pick up an ST elevation MI. My godmother two months ago passed away at home due to an left main, uh, due to an anterior MI because her symptoms was nausea and vomiting and the neighbors thought she was just, and she thought she was having food poisoning. She had nausea, she had vomiting, she collapsed and died at home and post-mortem showed she had an LED occlusion. And it's also, as you said, yeah, it's, it's very sad. So um, she passed away on, uh, I mean, she had already collapsed at home by the time CPR was done and everything, I think, you know, couldn't be saved. Uh, she's one of my best friend's mom. So she, it's associated with a higher complication rate. There's a higher mortality compared to typical presentation, obviously because it's not picked up early. So what are the factors associated with atypical presentation? This is something I tell people over and over again. The three important factors, if they're elderly, if they're female, and if they're diabetic. If you see an elderly lady who's diabetic, whatever, whatever complaint she comes in with, do an ECG. That's the rule. Yes. It's cheap, an it's available, it's yeah, it's so cheap. much. Exactly, it's cheap, it's available, do an ECG. If you have a history of heart failure, a history of hypertension, these patients also tend to present with atypical presentation. I've had a patient present with inferior MI with mood change, suddenly became depressed, stopped talking. They thought it was a stroke. When they did an ECG, it was an inferior MI. So these are very, very atypical presentations. So this is the data from United States National Registry for Myocardial Infarction. What they have found is women, especially young women, are significantly less likely than men to manifest with chest pain. So as our population continues to age, women will start outliving men. And that's a fact. And patients without chest pain will become the major number of acute coronary syndrome. So this is to understand atypical symptoms and to be aware of it is something very important. So why is it that, you know, a lot of people talk about diabetic patients not having the typical symptoms or absent symptoms, and they don't, won't have symptoms at all. It's because they have this, it is believed, it's postulated, they have the tendency to autonomic neuropathy, which actually forces a defective anginal warning system. Angina is your body's warning to tell you that your heart is in distress. So if you don't have an autonomic neuropathy causes a defective anginal warning system and hence you don't have the pain. So now let's move on to the crux, the main dish. You know, we're going to talk about STEMI and ECGs. Don't worry, just sit back. I'm going to ask you very simple questions. Answers will all be given. Okay, so we're going to start with the basics of a 12 lead ECG. You have 10 electrodes that is required to do a 12 lead ECG. You have four electrodes on your limbs, right arm, left arm, uh, uh, right leg and left leg. So then you have four elect uh, six electrodes placed on your precordium, V1 to V6. You can see in this picture here. And this will give you 12 leads, V1 to V6, lead one, lead two, lead three, and lead AVR, AVF, and AVL. And where these leads look at, I will explain to you over and over again, and you will understand. Next, we're going to talk about the waves and the segment of an ECG. Now, this, the one that we are very concerned, you know about the P wave, you know about the QRS complex, and you know about the T wave. But the one that we are going to focus on today is something called the J point. The J point is the junction between the QRS complex and the ST segment. This is the QR, Q wave, the R wave, and the S wave. And this is the ST segment. The, end of S, sorry, 
the end of S to the beginning of T is known as the ST segment. And this junction between this ST segment and the QRS complex is known as the J point. So now we refer to MI, ST elevation MI, as a rise in this J point. This is the new definition. Next is to understand the axis. Now, it may be a bit daunting for you in the beginning when you look at too many axes, but I will try to explain it to you in a way that you can understand. Now, the axis is very simple. You just need to know the principles of electrophysiology, the main principle of electrophysiology. If something, if the electrical impulse is traveling towards a lead, that lead will show positive deflection. If it's going away from that lead, that lead will show a negative deflection. Now, if you have an inferior MI, if the damage is occurring in the inferior surface of the heart, and these three leads, two, three AVF, are the inferior leads, they are looking at the inferior surface. So whatever they look at will be seen as a positive deflection, an ST elevation. Whereas a lead that is looking from the opposite side like an AVL, it is going to go, it is going to show negative reflection. And this is known as a reciprocal ST depression. Don't be worried. I will explain it to you again. Look at lead three and lead AVL. They are almost 180 degrees from each other. By right, they're 150 degrees, but close to 180. They're looking at each other at an opposite direction. So anything that lead three sees as an ST elevation will will be seen as an ST depression in AVL. Understood, everyone? Good. Very good. Excellent. So now we'll look at the coronary arteries. Uh, you, you've always heard of three vessel disease. Uh, these are the three vessels. So the right coronary artery arises from the right coronary cusp, and then it supplies the inferior surface of the heart, the inferior surface and the posterior surface of the heart most of the time, 80% of the time. And then you have the left anterior descending artery, which is the main uh, blood supply for the heart. And it's also, you know, when you have an occlusion of the LAD previously, um, I mean, Betty, do you remember they used to call it the widow maker artery? Yes. And yeah, and you have the circumflex artery, which supplies the lateral surface of the heart. So if everyone's clear, I will show you an angiogram how they look like. This is how the coronary arteries look like. They, I mean, this, they are an absolute beauty when you look at them. Um, you know, this is the left anterior descending artery, and this is the diagonal branch of that artery. It's supplying the lateral surface, and this is supplying the anterior surface of the heart. These are the septal branches that are coming out. This is another view where you can see a circumflex artery. This is the circumflex artery with a large obtuse marginal branch, also known as an OM branch, and it's supplying the lateral surface of the heart. This is a dominant uh, right coronary artery. You have a post PDA, posterior descending artery, the PLV branch supplying the posterolateral uh, ventricular branch, and uh, it's supplying the uh, inferior surface and the posterior surface of the heart. So just remember these arteries, and then I will show you an example of later of what happens when they are occluded. Uh, this is another very, very important picture, which I always show when I'm teaching ECGs. Now, you need to know this picture because this will help you understand reciprocal changes and direct changes very, very well. Now, look at the heart. This is the heart. This is the chamber. This is the muscle. You have the endocardium, which is closest to the chamber. You have the muscle, which is the myocardium. And then you have the epicardial surface. Now, your coronary arteries, they are sitting on the epicardial surface. All right. So now we go to this picture. We go to this picture. Your coronary arteries are sitting on the epicardial surface. If you have an occlusion of, the, of a coronary artery, if the blood supply in that artery is occluded, where will you see the changes first? Will the changes be seen in an area? Now, before I start, I will just tell you, I told you there's an epicardial layer, then there's myocardium layer, and then there is an endocardium layer. The endocardium is seen closer to the AVL. The AVL is looking at the endocardium because the endocardium is closer to AVL. Okay. Whereas the epicardial surface is closer to the, this lead. 
if it's, a, if it's a right coronary artery, the 2, 3 AVF is looking at the epicardial artery. Now, let's say this epicardial artery, this right coronary artery, which is on the epicardium of the heart, becomes occluded. Where will blood supply be affected first? Is it the area furthest from the artery or the area closest to the artery that's occluded? So nobody's responding. So I'll just say, by right, it should be the area furthest from the artery. It is always the area furthest that is going to be impacted first because the area nearest has already, it will take time because the vessels are bigger. The area nearest to the, nearest to the artery will be the last to get affected. So by right, the endocardial surface will be showing changes first because they are furthest from the epicardium. So reciprocal changes in AVL will occur before direct changes are seen as an ST elevation in the inferior leads. If you don't understand, I will explain it to you again later. So here, this is where the artery is. So if the artery is occluded, the area furthest where the artery is supplying its blood will be affected first, will become ischemic first. And then the area closest to the artery will be affected. So that's basically the principle behind it. Now we'll talk about the diagnosis of ST elevation in the absence of left ventricular hypertrophy and left bundle branch block. If you have left bundle branch block, it's another criteria altogether. I will even explain that criteria for you today. So I've taken around 15 minutes to explain all this. So when you talk about only lead V2 to V3, if you have a new ST elevation at the J point, you must have in two contiguous lead V2 and V3, if it's a person less than 40 years old, you must have it 2.5 mm or 2.5 boxes. If the person is more than 40 years old, you must have it two, more than two boxes. Easy to remember. Older they are, two boxes. If they are younger, 2.5 boxes. If it's a woman, more than 1.5 boxes, regardless of their age. And then if you look at other leads, like the limb leads, leads other than V2 and V3, just one mm ST elevation is enough. One box is more is enough. In two in contiguous leads, one box is enough. So then we talk about this left bundle branch block, which always you know, terrifies everyone. When you talk about new or presumably new left bundle branch block, which is a STEMI equivalent. In most cases of bundle branch block, we don't know because we don't have a prior ECG for comparison. So this left bundle branch block, it interferes with ST elevation analysis and it should not be considered a diagnostic in isolation of MI. So they came up with a criteria last time and it's known as a Scabosa criteria. The original Scabosa criteria was like this. They said that if a patient, because in a patient with left bundle branch block and if they have a ventricular pace rhythm, it is very difficult to, uh, what do you call, diagnose um, uh, ST elevation MI because they are, it is normal for left bundle branch and pace rhythm when they have, if your QRS is positive, the ST segment will be negative. If your QRS is negative, the ST segment is positive. This is known as appropriate discordance. Sometimes, you know, if you look at this, you will think that this is an MI, but in a pace rhythm, in a LBBB, this is normal. This is an appropriate discordance. So how is it that you're going to, how is it that you need, how can you, diagnose um, MI in left bundle branch using the Scabosa criteria. So Scabosa came up with three criteria initially. First, they talk about concordant ST segment elevation of more than one mm in a leads with a positive QRS complex. So if you have a, in this lead, you have a positive QRS complex, and instead of having a negative ST segment, you have also positive ST segment. That means the ST segment and the QRS are both positive. This is bad. This is, this is an MI. And in lead V1 to V2, V3, when the QRS complex is negative, the ST segment also becomes negative. There's an ST depression. Whenever you follow the QRS complex, if the QRS is negative, the ST segment also follows. This is bad. This is concordance. Uh, uh, it, it is also a, a, a criteria for Left one, I mean, also a positive Scabosa criteria. Then the last one previously, they said it's excessively discordant. So if it is pure, if it is discordant, it is more than 5 mm. This is the old criteria. 
Now they have already changed that criteria, updated that criteria, and I will show you what it is. So last time a total, now if a total score is more than three, they say it's a specificity of 98% for diagnosing MI. But also remember a score of zero does not rule out STEMI as well. So during right ventricular pacing, the ECG also shows this left bundle branch block. So that is why I told you it is also um, can be applied, but they are somehow less specific than in left bundle branch block itself. Then we came up with the modified SCABOSA criteria just to tackle this excessive discordance because the use of this 5 mm cutoff was very arbitrary and non specific. So sometimes left bundle branch block patients with large voltage will have an ST deviation of more than 5 mm. And you can, in the absence of ischemia, you cannot treat them as uh, MI using this criteria. So they came up with an improvement in that third SCABOSA criteria where they use. 25% of the depth of the preceding S wave. So if this ST segment elevation is more than 25% of this S wave of this QRS, then this is an uh, excessive discordance and you can call it positive SCABOSA criteria. So this is the simplest way to remember SCABOSA criteria. You can have a look at it. It's online most of the time. Okay. So this is an example of a concordant ST segment elevation in AVL. If you look at AVL, QRS is positive, ST segment is also positive, and you agree that this patient has got a left bundle branch block. You just remember it looks like a carrot. Uh, somebody has planted a carrot. You look at it, you will remember this is left bundle branch block. All right, so AVL. So now some people have always asked me, you've spoken about right bundle branch block. What about, uh, sorry, left bundle branch block. What about right bundle branch block? You know, Betty, you've heard this question many times, right? What about right bundle branch block? Why is it, you know, what is the criteria? So in, in right bundle branch block, you don't need, uh, uh, there's no, it doesn't require any special diagnostic criteria. So patient with STEMI, but patients with STEMI and RBBB, they have a very poor prognosis. And it's very difficult to detect transmural ischemia in patients with chest pain and right bundle branch block because you won't know that this uh, QRS is, is it an ST elevation or a QRS of a, of a bright bundle branch block. So that's where the difficulty arises. Next, we're going to talk about ECG localization. <clears throat> How do you localize where the MI is? This is a very beautiful picture. You should, I'm, this picture is going to come up very often and it shows you all the leads and the anatomy you know I, I found this online and i've been using it ever since for teaching so if you look at this heart this is the right coronary artery this is the rv branch this is the plv branch and this is the pda branch okay this supplies you don't remain, remember the name of the branches but they supply the posterior and the inferior surface of the heart this supplies the inferior surface this supplies the posterior surface behind the heart below the heart this supplies the anterior surface the led left anterior descending artery supplies the anterior surface of the heart you can see here and on this side the lateral surface of the heart is supplied by your circumflex now if you look at it you know, all the leads are there. You see the inferior leads, two, three AVF. They are looking at the inferior surface of the heart. And then you have the anterior leads, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. They are looking at the anterior surface of the heart. I've even shown you V7, V8, V9. These are special leads that look at the posterior surface of the heart. And then there's one more lead, a special lead called V4R, where you put it on the right side. And this looks at the right side of your heart if you have an right if you have an inferior mi you have to do a right sided chest lead to look at the inferior surface i mean to look at the uh, uh you take your v3 and v4 and you put it on the right side and th then it will show you the right side of your heart if there's any infarct which is all which always goes unmissed and i'll tell you why it's important later all right so now we're going to talk about an anterior STEMI. I showed you an anterior STEMI just now. It is due to an occlusion of the left anterior descending artery. So this is the anterior surface of the heart. An occlusion of this vessel, which is the left anterior descending artery, causes a anterior STEMI. And this supplies the major portion of the heart. And as such, due to the larger infarct size, it carries the worst prognosis. 
So you have an ST elevation with Q wave formation in the precordial leads and sometimes even in the high lateral leads because if it's occluded very proximally, the diagonal branch which supplies the high lateral wall will also be occluded. And then when you have an ST segment elevation, if you have it in the anterior leads, you will see reciprocal changes in a lead that looks at the opposite direction in lead 3 and AVF. Simple. This is an example of an anterior MI. You see the LED is occluded here, and this is the LED after it's been stented and opened up. You see you have see a diagonal branch coming here and a diffusely diseased LED. This is a left anterior descending artery. You can see septal branches coming out, and this is the diagonal branch. <coughs> These are real patients, you know? So now I'm going to give you a quiz. All right. So what are the changes you can see on this ECG? Betty, is there any way people can talk to me or chat or... Okay, so basically uh, we have two choices. If you're too shy to give your answer vocally, mm -hmm. verbally, you can actually type into the chat. Uh, if not, just unmute yourself for a while and then answer us. Okay, uh, so... so so Betty, can you see if anyone's answering? Uh, if okay, there is no one, I'm just going to give them a few seconds. But you must give a few minutes. Okay. So oh, Rick said. Of it, yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so have a look at did. it. Yeah, somebody did. What did they say? Uh, somebody said the uh, left under branch block, which I... Okay, so oh. Suntara said left under branch block. Rick say, may I know how do we explain the ischemia will cause depression? Bells, infarction causes elevation. Okay, we will okay later with that one, later we talk. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Sofian said high lateral. High lateral, what? I mean, why don't we uh, high lateral? Okay. So okay, we ask the question first. I don't okay. think you have sufficiently asked a proper yeah. question. Okay. okay. So if you look at what are the ECG changes that you see in this ECG, and this is an MI, this is an MI, this patient has a myocardial infarction. Can you tell me what myocardial infarction it is and where which leads are showing the changes? Okay. So uh, Emily says that uh, it is the anterior wall MI. Very good. Queen say anterior lateral. Excellent. Who said anterior infarction. lateral? May I know the name Queen, of the person? I don't know how to pronounce Queen Queenie. Queen Queenie. Okay. Queen Queenie. Okay, I'm going to give the answer now. So Queen Queenie is right. So this is, oh, what is happening? Okay. So this is an hyperacute anteroceptal MI. Yeah. But you can also see one and AVL, there's some ST elevation as well. Oh, uh, yes. But yeah. So you, this is an hyperacute, but because you look at the T wave, you see that the T wave is still so peaked. So that means this patient has come to the, there's ST elevation of more than one mm in the leads, more than one mm here. And here is more than two, it's actually three mm, and the J point is elevated. And this patient has a very hyperacute anthroceptal STEMI. Very good. And you also see one and AVL, there's some ST segment elevation. And in lead three, there's some ST depression. In lead AVF, there's some little, little bit of ST depression. These are reciprocal changes. Very good. Next ECG, what do you all see here? So next ECG, you just give them some time. Again, I'll give you some time. Again, what what is this? Is another MI? So Can you please tell me? Yeah, this ECG is another MI. Tell me where which lead you see the changes and what MI it is. Anyone? How come nobody is replying? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Never mind. It's all right. So this is okay. So there is uh, more replies now. So okay. Shamini say extensive anterior lateral MI. Very good. Uh, Yi Cheng say anterior septal MI. Okay. Uh, Natia says infi anterior uh, inferior. No. No. So Jiling okay, so says anterior lateral MI. Very good. So healing, you're right. It's extensive anterolateral MI. The anterior surface, the anterior surface is involved. And you also see one and AVL, that is ST segment elevation. 
So this is a very, uh, this is an MI that is also involving the diagonal branch. It's very proximal. That is why you see an ST segment elevation in almost all the leads, even V4, V5, V6 is elevated. One AVL is elevated. Here, I would say you don't see much of an ST elevation in V5, V6, you know, so if you, it's just going to be based in one AVL, you can, you can say it's an anteroseptal MI, but you are not wrong if you say it's an anterolateral as well. I wouldn't fault you. But this one is clearly an anterolateral MI because the lateral surface of the heart is clearly involved and you have very deep ST segment depression in two, uh, in three and AVF. Even in two, you already start seeing it. So the inferior uh, surface... Sorry, Rush, do you mind explaining to Natia why it's not an inferior MI? Sure. I will be explaining it later when I talk about okay. inferior MI, they will understand. I'm going to talk about all the MIs and once I'm done, you will understand why because I will correlate with the graph and I mean correlate with the pictures and also with the angiogram. So I will explain to you why this is not. As I've explained before, these are the leads that are looking at the anterior surface of the heart. This lead is looking at the inferior surface of the heart and you will understand how an inferior MI looks like later. I will show it to you. Okay, now, Faisal asked, so the occlusion is pros, PR, what? Oh, I don't understand. Now might we go proximal. In yeah, it's case. proximal to the diagonal branch. That's why you have, uh, I, will, I will show you an example later, okay? So now this is a very interesting, I think Betty is, or Betty and I, we can see something very scary here. Uh, if you can pick that up, if you can tell me what MI is this is, where do you see the changes? But there's something else very special there that when you become a house officer later, if you see this, Call your medical officer and your specialist and tell them to send this patient to a cardiologist as soon as possible because there is something on this ECG that is very sinister. But if you can tell me where you see ST segment changes, what type of MI it is, which lead you see the changes, I'll be very happy. And the third thing is something very, very, uh, if you can get it, I'll be very happy. So what do you see here on this ECG? What, what, where, 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 do the, where do the changes uh, occur? So, type in your answers. So, okay, anterior septal, anterior extensive, anterior ST elevation, and anterior leads. So, most. most they, you are right, you are right. It's right. anterior. But what we can see is this one. Do you know what this is? This is a PVC that is occurring when the heart is, yeah. So this is very dangerous because we call this, a, sorry, we call this a R on T phenomenon. So this is a premature ventricular complex. You are right, all of you are right. This is an anterior MI. You see changes in V1 to V6, and you can even see changes in one AVL, extensive MI. And what you can see is something very sinister. When a QRS, when the T wave is supposed to appear, when the heart is supposed to re, uh, repolarize, you can see another depolarizing uh, impulse there, a premature ventricular complex there. This is known as an R on T phenomenon. It is very dangerous because when you have this, this patient, especially an MI patient, is at risk for malignant ventricular arrhythmias, which carries a high mortality. So if you see something like this, if you see a PVC appearing in an anterior MI, be very, very vigilant. This patient is going to go into VT or VF, all right? Ah, so this one, what is this called? What, what do you see here? Now the ECGs are becoming simpler and simpler, right? Do you see here? Yeah, so what do you guys see here? So let me see if anyone has answered. Uh, so chest, extensive anterior, absent key. So that's before. Tachycardia. Now everybody say ventricular tachycardia. Ventricular tachycardia. Oh, is it okay. The fast is. So this is not uh, this is not ventricular tachycardia because I can understand why you'd want to think yeah, that because this. of the we'll broad complex. Broad complex. When you want to talk about VT, we'll talk again some other time. But this one is actually a tombstone pattern of extensive anterior MI. 
This is ST elevation with a tombstone morphology. And when you say tombstone, this is, they have come in where this is the height of the ST elevation. Now this carries, we call that once you have a tombstone, there's a very high chance we need to build a tombstone for the patient because the mortality is really, really high. So, and this patient is uh, uh, this type of uh, proximal, this is a proximal ID occlusion. It indicates a large territory infarct. And most of the time it's associated with a poor left ventricular function and a high likelihood of cardiogenic shock at death. So this is a, and you can see ST segment, very tall ST segment elevation, one AVL as well, and reciprocal changes, deep ST segment depression in three and ABF. Nine. And the okay. QRS is very, um, very yeah. uh, prolonged, right? Yeah, it's prolonged. So these patients are moving into a, a moving into arrhythmias as well. So these are, this is a, uh, what do you call, these are the type of issues that you don't want to see. And if you see this type of issues, you need to go into the lab and uh, open up this vessel as soon as possible. And uh, yeah. So next I'm gonna talk about inferior MI. So I, I did tell you, I'm gonna talk about inferior MI. So inferior MI, it, it represents more than half of all myocardial infarctions, all right? Up to 40% of patients with an inferior STEMI will have a concomitant right ventricular infarction, all right? So why is it important to know if you have a right ventricular infarction? Is because these patients will develop severe hypotension if you give them nitrates. If you cause, if you give them anything that causes peripheral vasodilatation, it reduces venous return to the heart, reduces right ventricular filling, and the blood pressure will come down. So the treatment for these patients, why it's important to pick up right ventricular infarction, is fluid challenge. Because very simply, if you give fluid, the fluid will go back to the heart and expand the right ventricle. And there is frank stalling mechanism. The more you expand the myocardial fibers, the more they will contract. This is the frank stalling mechanism. Uh, so up to 20% of patients with inferior STEMI will develop significant bradycardia. And this can be due to the second or third degree AV block because the AV nodal branch arises from your uh, right coronary artery. So it is there's different. So if, if you we are not too worried if although there is an increase in mortality if you develop uh, uh, second degree or third degree AV block in inferior MI, it is even a great. It is we are not too we are not too worried if you have already reperfused the vessel, because we expect this to happen in these patients because the right coronary artery supplies the AV block AV node, but if you have second or third degree AV block in an anterior MI, that is a grave prognosis because it tells you that the territory that is involved is so huge till it has even affected the AV branch, the fascicles and all that. So this is what you need to remember. So an inferior STEMI can also be associated with a posterior infarction, which actually confers a worse prognosis because it is an increase, because an increased area of myocardium now is involved in posterior then the prognosis is much poorer. Now I'm gonna tell you something which a lot of people don't know. Whenever you talk about inferior MI, anterior MI, lateral MI, posterior MI, you are talking about the left ventricle. The only time you're talking about the right ventricle is when you talk about the right ventricular infarction. That is the only time you're talking about the right ventricle. Whenever we talk about the MI, the major portion of this uh, discussion of MIs are talking about the left ventricle. This, so a lot of people didn't know that. I, I've had medical students who thought that the right coronary artery supplies only the right ventricle. So when you're talking about an inferior surface, you're talking about the inferior surface of the right ventricle. No, you're talking about the inferior surface of the left ventricle. So every MI is talking about the left ventricle. Only right ventricular infarction specifically is looking at the right ventricle, all right? <clears throat> so again, if you have an inferior MI, I showed you the inferior leads 2, 3 ABF, you will have an ST, uh, ST segment elevation and there will be reciprocal ST depression in AVL because this lead is looking at it in the opposite direction. So which artery is involved? Most of the time, 80% of inferior STEMI is due to an occlusion of the dominant right coronary artery. Less commonly, 18% of the time, the culprit vessel is a circumflex artery. And occasionally, you know, one to 2% of the time, you have what it's called a type three or a wrap around left anterior descending. 
it supplies the anterior surface and then it wraps around and supplies the inferior surface as well. So this is the unusual pattern of ECG, which shows a concomitant inferior and anterior ST elevation that sometimes can be confused for myocarditis because you see diffused ST segment elevation, inferior wall, anterior wall, everywhere there's ST elevation. So you might think that this is myop myopericarditis or something. Why is there so diffuse uh, ST segment elevation? But you may be dealing with a, a type 3 LED or a wrap around LED. Okay. So another thing you have to remember in order to understand the ECG, when the right coronary artery, it supplies the medial portion of your heart, the right side, the medial portion, whereas the circumflex artery, it supplies the lateral part and the inferior wall. Whenever it is, if it's a dominant circumflex, if it's supplying the inferior wall, it will supply the lateral and the inferior wall. Why is this important? Because I'm going to teach you how you can tell which coronary artery is involved by looking at the ECG. Very simple. Now, just now I was telling you the medial, this is the right coronary artery. It is closer to lead three, right? So lead three is looking, it's much closer to the medial surface of the heart and where the right coronary artery is. Lead two also looks at the inferior surface, but lead two is closer to the circumflex artery, more towards the lateral wall. This is the clue. If you see an ST elevation, which is taller in lead three compared to lead two, you are dealing with a right coronary artery occlusion. If you see an ST elevation that is almost the same height, that means lead three and lead two are almost the same height, or lead two is even slightly taller than lead three, you are probably dealing with the circumflex artery occlusion. Another clue, if you have, if you do a V3R and a V4R, you do a right ventricular lead, if you do a right-sided chest lead, and you see right ventricular infarction involvement, this cannot be anything other than a right coronary artery occlusion because the right ventricle can only be supplied by the right coronary artery. And if you have a lateral, a high lateral or lateral infarct together with an ST LV inferior MI and lateral, no right-sided involvement, the lateral wall, high lateral wall can only be supplied by the circumflex artery. Unless you have a super dominant RCA, which sometimes can happen, but these are the general clues. But the right, right ventricle is supplied by the right coronary artery, by the RV branch of the right coronary artery. Now, let's go. So again, as I was telling, you know, the RCA occlusion is usually directed inferiorly rightward. So lead three is higher than two because lead three is looking more to the right side. And if it's a left coronary artery occlusion, it's directed inferiorly and leftward, I mean more laterally producing an ST segment elevation in the lateral leads, one V5, V6. Simple, I'll show you an example. So again, I will repeat because repetition is very important. ST elevation lead three higher than lead two is RCA occlusion. And you have signs of right ventricular infarction. This is very important and reciprocal changes. In circumflex, either lead two and lead three, the same height, most of the time they are the same height. And then you have lead two, which is taller than lead three. You may not see the reciprocal ST depression in one AVL. Why? Very simple. In order to see reciprocal changes, you, the inferior MI, which is showing an ST elevation, the lateral leads, which is looking at it from the opposite direction, is going to show ST depression. But then, in circumflex occlusion, the lateral wall is also involved. So by right, there should be an ST elevation. When there's an ST elevation, at the same time, there's an inferior infarct. So inferior also showing ST elevation. So the lateral lead is looking at the inferior and also looking at the lateral. One side, it has to go up and the other side, it is showing reciprocal. So the two of them cancel each other out. So you don't see any changes. If you don't understand, it's okay. You will understand one day when you read about it again. Okay, this is just extra information. So now, what am I is this? Can anyone tell me? And uh, which, uh, there is a clue in this ECG. You have to tell me which coronary artery is involved, what type of MI is this, and which coronary artery is involved. Just a clue, this is a V4R. In case you didn't see, I'm giving you a clue. This is a right-sided chest lead. Ah, 
So we'll give them some time, Betty. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> Okay, so anyone? <coughs> Let's see. Oh, oh sorry. Oops. Oops. <laughs> okay. I, uh, so yeah, somebody so said, uh, Daniel said, inferior am I affecting the RCA? Very so good. Why does okay. Daniel say it's inferior okay. am I or Each everyone? Also yeah, we, so RCA. Wow, RCA. I can press the thing. Okay. Yes, I tell you, my audience are all very smart. Fantastic, your audience. I'm so happy that I'm here today. You are right. Yes. This is an early inferior STEMI. I'm going to show you something else. Okay. Remember, uh, there's an ST elevation in lead three. You look at lead three, it is yes. higher than lead two. And you look at V4, the right-sided lead, there is ST elevation of more of around one box or 0 0.5 box. So this is a very subtle ST elevation in V4 in the right-sided lead and tells you that this is a right coronary artery occlusion. So I'm very happy that you people have, I mean, most of you have understood what I was trying to tell you. So this is a right coronary artery. And if you can understand this basic principle, it's very, very good. The next thing I want to teach you is, remember I told you about the principle of electrophysiology. If one shows ST elevation, the lead opposite to it will show ST segment depression. So because one, if, because the, if this is looking directly at it, this is looking at it from the opposite, so it will show ST depression, AVL. Now the mirror image of this, if you invert this AVL, it will look exactly like your lead three. Look at that. Look at your lead three and you look at your AVL when you invert it. So this is what you call reciprocal change. All right, so you do understand? And most of the time in MIs, you have to look for reciprocal changes. Why is that important? Sometimes we won't see the, when you have, we have I, think, I think Betty will agree with me that many times the patients present very early with MI, with chest pain. And when you do an ECG, that it's not very glaring. So sometimes we just tend to add, sometimes people, you know, will miss that. They will just say, you know, it's gastritis and send them home. Don't do that. If they have risk factors, repeat the ECG 10 minutes later or 15 minutes later to look for changes. And one of the clues, even if you don't see any changes in the other leads, look at AVL. Remember I told you the vessel furthest from the, the area furthest from the uh, epicardium, furthest from the blood vessel, which is the endocardium, will become ischemic first. So the thing, the lead that is looking at this endocardium will be the reciprocal leads. So the reciprocal changes will occur before the direct changes. So if you are dealing with an inferior MI, make sure you have this in mind. When you're looking at an ECG of a patient whom you suspect could be having acute coronary syndrome, always look at the AVL. Is there any ST segment depression there? Is there any ST segment depression? Repeat the ECG again 10 minutes later and it will become more glaring. The second thing is always to look at the AVR. Is the AVR elevated? Because that will offer another graver prognosis if you're dealing with a, a left main occlusion or proximal ID occlusion. That I will explain to you later. So this is an example of, again, example of right ventricular infarct. You can see that it's becoming more prominent in this patient when, uh, what do you call, the ST segment in V4R is much bigger. So this is ST segment in V4R consistent with right ventricular infarction, correct. This is an angiogram of an, an RCA that is occluded. Remember the RCA that you saw was very beautiful just now? This is how it looks like when it's occluded. This one happens when you open up the patient. And this patient came in with AV block and everything, very ill patient, but luckily survived. This patient had a, a infra posterior, M, infra, a inferior MI with RV involvement. This is the right ventricular branch you can see here. So this branch is occluded, hence the right ventricular involvement. Even from the now, angiogram, oh, sorry, can I yes. just demonstrate that even from the angiogram, yeah. you can actually see that the inferior wall of air is supplying is hypokinetic. Correct. Correct. Exactly. And this patient is quite ill because there's the LAD is also occluded, Correct. isn't it? Yeah, it's LAD is also occluded. It's a very young patient, 30 plus. So I haven't shown the, so we did the inferior MI and after that we did the left main bifurcation. That was another uh, procedure later on. 
so now, okay, now look at this ECG and tell me where you think the changes are, which lead you see the changes, what MI is this, and which vessel is involved. Before that, sorry, let me go back to this uh, inferior MI that I showed you just now. And you look at this one ABL. You see one ABL, there's ST depression. ABL also ST depression. One also has ST depression. These are what you call reciprocal changes. I forgot to talk about one just now. So now let's look at this one. Clue is look at one ABL and then look at the other leads. And then tell me where you think this ST segment, I mean, where do you see the ST segment changes and which coronary artery, what MI is this and which coronary artery is involved? We wait. We will wait. I will, I'm <laughs> more than happy to wait. We can extend a bit longer than, than 10 p.m., I think. Okay. I think we have no choice because it's almost 10 p.m. already. <laughs> yeah, nine minutes. But I have a few more slides on it. It's okay. Okay, that's great. There's no problem. Okay. Okay, so anyone? What, what are the findings that you Emily, find? Emily said inferior MI RCA. Okay. Uh, where do you see oh. the changes? Yeah, that's more important. Where do you see the changes? Remember, I told you look at lead two, lead three, wh whether the ST segment elevation is taller in lead three or in lead two. So, BM said ST elevation is two, three, and AVF. So, I think inferior MI is no doubt, but what Which he wants to know is, um, yeah, two, three, where three, is, what is the inferior and inferior? Okay. Never mind. Okay, so I will. I think we have we have had enough. So look closely. You will find that there is the lead one is relatively quiet. All right, ABL yes, but it's not a mirror image. It's ST depression. It's not a mirror image of three. But you look at two, three ABF. There's ST segment elevation, but two and three are almost the same height. Two and three are almost the same height, and then. You look at V6 here, there is a very subtle ST segment elevation of one box. So this is a inferior MI. All right. And because lead two and read with absence of reciprocal changes in lead one, this suggests a circumflex artery occlusion. All right. And this is how it looks like. This is the circumflex artery that is occluded. There's a thrombus here after the thrombolysis. And this is after we put two stands there. The vessel is much bigger. This is the lateral wall that is being supplied, the inferior wall as well. So this is an example of an infro, inferior MI, which also supplies the lateral wall. So it's, an, it's a good example of that. So that is why you go back to the ECG. You look at this, lead two and lead three are almost the same height. Lead one is relatively quiet because if you have a lateral MI, by right one and ABL is supposed to show ST segment elevation. But at the same time, they also have to show ST segment depression because of reciprocal changes in the inferior leads. But now, so the ST segment elevation and the ST segment depression cancel each other out and they become isoelectric. Simple, right? Easy to remember. So next one is this ECG. Yeah, Betty, this is a very interesting ECG. What do you all think this could be? Where do you see the changes? If, and very simple, look at the ECG. Where do you see the ST segment changes? What do you think it could be? What do you think it could be? Let's wait for a while. Okay. So you've been busy. Is it busy in your hospital? Yeah, because now the once COVID is over, patients are starting to come in. So I finish my cases every day at 10, 11. <laughs> okay, so uh, fast read. Oh, says very good. Uh, many fast people. Read, uh, Sundara, okay. Fazrin said, and uh, wait, we start from Emily. Emily V1 to V4, anthroceptal MI. Fazrin, anthroceptal. Sundara Mutri, antero inferior lateral MI. Good. ST elevation anterior lead. Inferior anterior MI, RCA with wrap around LED. Um, yeah, this Shamini, you are right, Shamini. 
extensive anterior inferior oh boopy is also correct yes this is a anterior this is an anterior inferior mi due to a wrap around led fantastic wow i'm really amazed betty you know i thought you know this will be difficult for them so <laughs> you have anterior leads you know you have the anterior leads as st segment elevation in the anterior leads v1 v2 v3 v4 v5 but instead of st segment depression you have two three avf which is showing st segment elevation as well so this is an anterior inferior mi and this anterior inferior mi you're absolutely right is occurring due to a wrap around led and i will show you this is the occluded vessel and you see this this ischemia here and then when you once this vessel has been stented has been opened up you see it's supplying it's supposed the the led is supposed to just stop here but it's going down and wrapping under the inferior surface of the heart this is the led so that is why I'm, i've put in the angiogram so that you can correlate and hopefully one day one of you will become an interventional cardiologist or a cardiologist so this is how an anterior inferior STEMI looks like. Initially, we thought that this was um, myopericarditis because there was just diffused as a segment elevation. But once we did an angiogram, we realized that we picked an inferior anterior inferior STEMI. So this is a classic type three LED, a wrap around LED. Fantastic, guys! I'm really happy. Uh, Rush, just want yeah. to ask. Yeah. In this case, right? Let's say you have had an okay. occlusion over the L uh, RCA. Mm -hmm. which is, uh, has been missed. Sorry? And, uh, no, let's say you have had an occluded RCA yeah. and then there is retrograde from the LAD. And also happen, correct. And yeah. also happen, right? Yes. Yes. So basically, yes. you can also happen. Correct. So that I didn't want to mention that because it would be too high five for the medical students. But if you have either an LAD that is occluded or CTO, or a right coronary artery that has a CTO and it's receiving collaterals from the LED or the LED is receiving collaterals from the RCA. If the main branch is occluded, let's say the LED has a CTO, RCA is giving the collateral. If the RCA undergoes an MI, you will have an anterior inferior MI. And if it's CTO an LED, means a chronic total occlusion. Chronic total occlusion, correct. Chronic total occlusion. So if you have that, you are absolutely right. This is something that, this is another thing that can happen. And that was another thing that we were thinking of, you know, whether this could happen. And that is the concept of a double jeopardy in, in CTO where in chronic total occlusion, where all of us tend to uh, reason, one of the reasons we tend to open a CTO is if you have a diseased vessel that is supplying that CTO. And if you have ulcerated plug and that vessel is supplying an occluded vessel, a CTO vessel, this vessel has a high chance of getting an MI. And if you have an MI in this vessel, it is going to affect two ter different territories, two vessel territories, which will offer a far graver prognosis. Um, now we're gonna talk about, this is my last MI, we're gonna talk about a posterior MI. It is usually never, it never occurs in isolation. It usually occurs in the context of an inferior or lateral infarct. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's isolated is very uncommon, it's very uncommon. So. If you have, uh, uh, the reason why this is a very dangerous MI is because it's very difficult to pick up. A lot of people won't look at it because it will show V1 to V3 as the segment depression. So sometimes people, if it's in isolation, people may miss it. They won't pick it up. So you have to do something called a posterior lead. Every right, every inferior MI, you have to do a right-sided lead and a posterior lead. So how do you do a posterior lead? You put the, uh, uh, you take the, uh, lead v, v, uh, v4 v5 v6 and you put it v7 here at the posterior axillary line same horizontal as the same place as the v6 in front v8 at the tip of scapula and v9 on the other end very simple for me to remember what i'll do is i'll put the v8 at the tip of the scapula and the other two on either sides so it's very easy to remember so again, you know, we are looking at the posterior. So I show you this picture again. This picture is really amazing. So you look at the anatomy of the heart and the leads as well. This is where the V7, V8, V9, they're looking at the posterior surface of the heart. So if you have an infarct here, you will have an ST segment elevation here. But the leads that are looking at it reciprocal, V1, V2, V3, will show ST segment depression because they are looking at it from the opposite direction. Simple as that. Okay, so what do you see in this ECG?
Okay, I'll give you all some time. Hello, is anyone there? Yes. <laughs> You're studying the ECG, so am I. So, uh, Fazrin said ST depression in V1 to V3, so does Emily. Okay. Depression in V1 to V3. Anyone ST see anything V3. else? Anyone see inferior MI with posterior involvement? Yi Ching, wow. Yi Ching, are you a medical student or you are a doctor? Yi Ching? Yi Ching, can you answer? Are you a medical student or are you a doctor? Yi Ching doesn't want to answer. Yi Ching is shy. No, Lash. You have to give them time to type. So oh. inferior M MI with posterior involvement. Very good. ST elevation in one, two, and three, correct? Lead one, lead two. Yes, inferior, inferior MI, MI with posterior involved. Very serious. good. Yes. Very good. Very good. So, okay. So, all Even of them. Yeah. So, you guys are right. But there's one more thing that you all have to look lateral. at. Lateral. Yes, correct. V5 and V6. The lateral wall is also involved. So this is an infro posterior lateral. And if you do a V7, V8, V9, okay? So infro lateral with posterior extension uh, as suggested by this horizontal ST depression V1 to V3. You have a tall, broad R wave in V2, V3 and dominant R wave. This dominant R wave in V2, V3, these are all things that points towards a uh, posterior involvement. And the same person, same patient, when you do a posterior, look at that V7, V8, V9, you see the ST segment elevation. So this is making this an infrolateral posterior STEMI. And this is a huge territory infarct, huge territory infarct. The inferior wall is involved, the lateral wall is involved, the posterior wall is involved. The only wall that is not involved is the anterior wall. And if you look at this, this is how it looks like. This is the ECG of this. This is the angiogram of this patient. This is the occlusion of the artery here. You can see. And I've included the right coronary artery here. You see the right coronary artery here is very small. So we call it a recessive right coronary artery. So this patient has got a dominant circumflex artery. And this circumflex artery makes it a left dominant system. So the right coronary artery in these patients will be very small. So you see what happens. This is where the occlusion is. You can see this whole area where the inferior surface and the posterior surface here, there is no artery supply. And this is what happens after I open up the vessel. Look at that. Huge vessel supplying the infra posterior wall. See? All this which you did not see just now. It's a huge vessel. And... This, and then we're going to talk about a few STEMI equivalents, okay? I'm going to talk about, I'm, I'm not going to talk about a lot. I'm just going to talk about left main coronary artery occlusion. So if you have a left main occlusion, uh, you have an ST elevation in AVR, you know, AVR. And if you see an ST elevation in AVR, it's a left main coronary artery occlusion, all right? So don't have to remember much, just remember that. And sometimes this ST elevation in AVR is not specific to left main coronary, left main occlusion. It can also be due to a very proximal LED occlusion as well. And uh, I'm not going to explain all this. I'm not going to explain. This is all not important. So in the context of an anterior STEMI, we can talk about it. When you have an ST elevation in AVR of more than 1 mm, it is very specific for an LED occlusion proximal to the first septal branch. Not important for you to remember. The fact that you see AVR itself, you must alert the lab to go in for an angiogram because the patients will be very ill. Uh, this is an example. So what do you all see in this ECG? Can anyone tell me? Anyone? Just give them some time. So ST elevation in AVR. Correct. Very good. Say yes. So this is ST elevation in AVR. The QRS is broadened. Oh. Yeah. And there's a ventricular ectopic. 
Correct. So this is a marked ST segment elevation, AVR more than one. You have seen multiple ST segment depression, diffuse ST segment depression. This is an example of left main coronary artery occlusion. So I'll show you the patient's uh, coronary artery. Betty will probably get a heart attack when she sees. So this is a tight occlusion. And this, there were, I think there was a thrombus here, which went distally. So then we had to quickly wire this vessel. Luckily, she had a dominant RCA. <clears throat> we had to wire this vessel and then um, uh, stand up to the ostium of the LED. So you see the LED here, the ostium of the left main, ostium of the left main is occluded. And then even the LED is diseased and there's no flow downwards. So this patient uh, while it was quickly wired. We put a stand here, coronary stand, right up to the uh, mid LED. And uh, you can see that the flow returning and the contraction also has improved. Oh, this is interesting. Wait, hold on. Can we go back to this? It's not easy to wire that left main, right, with the osteo yeah, And yeah. then what, do you use a side hole? Keep the no, blood I, pressure didn't, drop? I, don't, I don't use uh, side hole catheters because I think the side hole catheters are only to make the doctors feel good. <laughs> because I don't think it, it offers... Oh, but much. sometimes it ventricularizes. Um, no, but it ventricularizes, but then, uh, but even, even if you be the side hole, the catheter is still ventricularizing. The catheter is still deeply engaged. So the side hole is just so that the doctors can see a less ventricularized form of the a wave of the blood pressure. So I don't think it's going to offer much benefit. So what I do usually do is just when I engage, I'll put a wire in and then I'll disengage the catheter. Yeah, and right. a, yeah, and I'll use a dual lumen uh, catheter like Crusade to wire the circumflex. And then after that, I will just immediately, I'll, I'll, before that, I'll just wire down whichever vessel it goes into and blow up the ostium uh, of the left main first. And then that will actually allow flow to go down. And then after that, I will start uh, doing work, you know, uh, putting the second, uh, putting a dual lumen catheter, rewiring the circumflex, and then preparing the vessel better before I stand. Yeah. And this asks, is there a role for thrombolysis in this case? If the patient can't come, you see, thrombolysis is not recommended if you have a left main occlusion. It is not better than doing a PCI because, uh, you know, but then, of course, in our setting, there are some patients who cannot go to a PCI capable center within an hour, within an hour or two. If you cannot go do that, then you have to give the next best thing with this thrombolysis, but I wouldn't recommend it. Nice, nice. I, this is very nice. Yeah, and uh, so the next one is, uh, oh, I've already given the answer. Okay, so this is another example. If you see, there's also AVR, there's ST segment elevation AVR and V1. And this patient also presents quite similar to a, uh, an ST segment depression in 2-3 AVF, diffused ST segment depression as well. And this is actually due to an osteal LED occlusion. This is the, this is the ECG. This is the osteal LED that is occluded. And this is after we have stent up to the left main. And this patient also has a CTO of the right coronary artery. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, you know, so uh, after we, this patient actually survived, uh, once we did this, we proceeded with the CTO and uh, the coronary total occlusion of the right side, this patient has survived. This is where the right coronary artery, uh, the left coronary artery is supposed to come down like this. And the ostium of the left, uh, left anterior descending artery is occluded. So, and this is the left main, this is the circumflex. And so we have put a stand from left main to the LED. And next I'm gonna talk about last one called a D-winter or STT wave complex. This I promise you is my last slide. So this is known as an anterior STEMI equivalent. Uh, so the key diagnostic feature is there's an ST depression, a peaked T wave in precordial leads. And it's seen in around 2% of acute LED occlusion. And because people are not familiar with this ECG, a lot of time it goes missed. So this is an example of an ST depression. You see that the J wave has come down and it takes a high peak like that. It just continues with the T wave. This is known as a D winter ECG. So it, you can have this ECG after an anterior MI or it can even precede an anterior MI. People used to say it precedes an anterior MI, but now we have even seen anterior MI evolving into the winter. It is known now. So why it's important? Because patients with these D-winter ECGs, they are often younger, more likely to be male, and with a higher incidence of hypercholesterolemia compared to the classic STEMI patients. 
and there's a growing evidence now to suggest it's a high predictive value for acute LED occlusion. So now they all call it a STEMI equivalent, where you need to receive emergent reperfusion therapy with PCI or thrombolysis. And as I mentioned just now, the original report suggested that the ECG did not change or evolve, but now it can be evolved from or evolved to an MI. That means it can become an MI or it can follow an MI. So this is an example of a, of a D winter ECG. You can see this upsloping, you look at that. The J, the, the T, J point is down here and suddenly it slopes up, upsloping and becomes a peaked T wave. Upslope becomes a peak T wave. Upslope becomes a peak T wave. Patient got chest pain. So this is a D winter sign. So you can show it to your, your friends later or, or when you become a house officer, you can teach your medical officers, you know, that you know this ECG because of the Raj has already taught you. And this is an example of a, of a D winter that is actually morphing into a anterior MI. Look at that, ST elevation. So it's an LED occlusion. Q already has been formed in V1 and V2. Correct, correct. Q has already been formed. So, and you see D winter is forming. So it's preceding an, an MI or morphing, in, sorry, morphing into an anterior MI. So these are all, all examples. So in this patient, the LED occlusion is very proximal to the first diagonal branch. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Betty. And I really enjoyed myself. I really enjoyed myself. So any questions? Can we take questions or not, Raj? Sure, sure. Yeah, please. So um, <laughs> I think we have answered the Anit's question uh, about the thrombolysis. So anyone with any questions, we will take some questions now. Uh, let's see. We are also um, broadcasting live to um, Facebook. So we can also take questions from there. So anyone with any questions? Or maybe they understood you so well because you <laughs> really, really uh, explain it so thoroughly. Okay. Is right brand branch block associated with ACS? Um, no, as I explained just now, okay, I, I will tell you. So if you have right bundle branch block in the presence of an MI, it's very difficult to diagnose. All right. It's very difficult to diagnose. Number two, okay, if you have right bundle branch block, it offers a far graver prognosis. So how do you, what do you do when you have a right bundle branch block? If you have a right bundle branch block, you look at all the other leads, look for reciprocal changes in other leads that don't show the RBBB changes, okay? And you will have contiguous ECG changes. And secondly, if in doubt, bring the patient to the cat lab and have a look at the coronary artery. Because even in your guideline, if you look at the ESC guideline for uh, ESC guideline, which was updated in 2017, when you're talking about ST elevation MI, they clearly state in the presence of right bundle branch block and MI, it offers a far graver prognosis because transmural ischemia will be missed and cannot be detected. So you have to keep that in mind. ST elevation AVR, is there a role for thrombolysis in this? If you cannot, if it's a left, uh, of course, there is a role for thrombolysis if it is a proximal LED occlusion or even if it's a left main because if you cannot bring them to a cat lab in time, if the patient is hypotensive, these patients will be very ill. You know, you, you won't have time to, uh, uh, what do you call? You won't have time to uh, send the patient to, uh, you won't, thrombolysis won't have time to work, all right? So you need to bring them to a cat lab. You need to put them on other devices like intraortic balloon pump, and the left ventricular assisting devices like impeller and all that, ECMO, those things, are, because these patients will be very ill. Next question is, is PVC a sign of ACS? PVC per se is not a sign of ACS, but PVC in the presence of chest pain offers a grave prognosis if you have an MI, because the heart is now very excitable. The heart is excitable because it's injured and it's excitable. And if you have a PVC that appears when the heart is supposed to be repolarizing, there are new electrical discharges coming, then this will predispose the heart to ventricular tachycardia, all this malignant arrhythmias, right? Any other questions? So it is very important from this lecture by Dr. Raj to actually be able to pick up okay, an MI when you are sitting there waiting in the emergency room. That is extremely important. 
because you will be the first one who is facing a patient with chest pain. Okay? Uh, and then the next step of action will be based on what, you, what diagnosis you made from the ECG that you are reading. And with this uh, lecture, we hope that you'll be very confident in reading ECGs in patients with MI. That is very important. So you're, many of you are waiting to get your housemanship. Some of you are already working in ER, okay? And some of you may not have consultant cardiologists or interns to help you with this diagnosis. So it is very important that this lecture will teach you how to identify MR. So are there any questions? Usually there are plenty of questions, but yours is so... Yeah, very quiet. Okay, so if there's no more questions, let me check my Facebook. Facebook was so quiet. Wow. Everybody understood everything that you've said. So with that, um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, Raj. I'll speak to you later. I yeah, really yeah. thoroughly enjoy your lecture. Yeah, yeah. I, I hope I did justice to your uh, to the time. Oh my god, it was one of the better lectures. One of the best. Oh uh, yes. All my lecturers have been really, really good. Um yeah, I'm so happy. So uh, you can actually, if this is recorded, you can actually go through this um uh this lecture again. You can actually listen to this lecture, listen to what I've said. And uh, very most importantly, you know, whenever you're dealing with an MI, you know, if you're not sure. The clue that I'm going to give you is repeat, repeat, repeat the ECG. Yes. Don't true. rest with one ECG. Correct, Betty? Do you agree with me? Yes. Repeat, Always repeat, repeat. 5, 10, 15 minutes, okay? That's why they call it serial ECG. That's one. Correct. Okay? That is the Two, reason why you yes. call it a serial ECG. Two so, is, secondly, is you may not okay, um, be able to read the ECG initially, but always do your best to make a conscious a conscious decision about what you think you are reading. Then okay. you go and ask somebody and say, okay, I did it. I Yes, this is what I thought in the first place. It's yeah. very important. That will help your learning. So everybody say thank you very much. Uh, okay, yes. <laughs> this time I will... Okay, this time uh, I managed to record and then I will do it on your YouTube. Um... Yes, you can subscribe to Beating Hearts in YouTube. I, I am already subscribing to Beating Hearts. <laughs> and then uh, maybe I'll ask Raj for the... Can I have the PDF uh, of your slide so that I can put sure. it up to the Telegram? So I, I need to... What I need to do is I need to... Uh, I think I need to check and see whether there are names of patients there on the on the videos. Oh, if yes. it's none, then I will, I will send it to you, the PDF. All right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So something... Uh, but you know what, whatever that I have told you, whatever that I have told you, you just have to listen to me explaining the ECGs and you just have to open an ECG book. The only way you can get better is by looking at more and more ECGs. There's a reason why I put up all those pictures because I believe in correlating different learning techniques. Angiogram, ECG, and then pictures. Remember there's a picture of the heart with all the leads there. That's one of the most beautiful pictures I've ever seen. Uh, the three-dimensional one. Correct, correct. Yeah, I love that too. I love that yeah, too. Yeah, so yeah. always remember your heart is three-dimensional. Yeah, so three that, that picture helps you with your reciprocal uh, ECG changes. Right. It helps you identify the territory that is involved because it's a 3D um, depiction of the heart and the ECG yeah. leads. Yeah. Yeah, so if any of you come to Alosta, I'll be uh, do drop by and let me know that you are part of Dr. Betty's clan. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, first it will be me. I haven't been to Alosta for a long oh, time. Really? Yeah, yeah. But yes, you were from Alosta. Right? Yeah, yes, yeah. I was born I in Alosta. You were born in Alosta, yeah. Yeah. Okay, oh, thank was, you, that everybody. Was amazing. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I really yeah, enjoyed it. Next week, we will be back with another webinar. If I remember correctly, it will be with uh, Prof. Ben, uh, who is a neurosurgeon. We will talk about uh, how to identify. Yeah, I can't remember the title. I haven't worked on next week's one. See you guys. Bye, Bye Raj. Bye. Thank bye. You so bye. Much.